It is rare for one team to have multiple dynasties, but it happens. The Celtics in the 60s and 80s, the Lakers in the 50s, 80s, and 2000s, LeBron's hairline in the 2000s. It went away, now it is back and dominating. It takes something really special to get back up after a dynasty phases out. And that is the question we all have for the San Antonio Spurs right now. Was it just Tim, Tony, Manu, and Pop? Or is the Spurs organization as outstanding as we thought? In this video, we're breaking down this important offseason for the Spurs. We're going to talk about moves they can make in trades and free agency to kickstart that rebuild and begin the next dynasty. Hey, it's Casey. It is AM Hoops. It is offseason Wednesday. I'm kind of cheating here with the Spurs because earlier I said we're only going to do teams that aren't going to make the playoffs. So I'm kind of betting that they won't. I mean, LaMarcus Aldridge had surgery, but uh, I put a poll out there and you guys overwhelmingly picked the Spurs. So let's go. First, let's answer that question. Yes, the Spurs are that good. I mean, they already set up for the next dynasty. It just blew up in their face. I'm not sure many people saw Kawhi Leonard just up and leaving. The Davis Berton situation didn't help any. And as much as that all sucks, here they are. So let's look at the basics of this offseason. Their draft pick, most likely 11th, could be all the way down to 14th. Cap space, a whole lot if DeMar DeRozan opts out and decides to leave, just a little if he stays. Their needs, shooting, defense, youth in the front court, a franchise player, their tools to build with. The $9.2 million mid-level exception and the $3.6 million biannual exception. They're relevant free agents. DeMar DeRozan with that player option, Jakob Pertl, a restricted free agent, and unrestricted Marco Bellinelli and Bryn Forbes. Now, if they do draft at 11th, they would love to get Isaac Okoro. He would be that wing of the future. Okoro can defend, and you know he would develop offensively as a spur, except he'll almost definitely be gone by that time. So unless they want to trade up, they should consider taking Tyrese Maxey at 11. He would play at two guard next to DeJounte Murray after DeMar DeRozan leaves. Maxi would fill the Spurs shooting and defensive needs. Okay, so right off the top, I hate to let the air out of this video, but honestly, the big offseason for the Spurs is probably next offseason, and that's because they'll have as many as six players coming off their books, including their top four highest paid players. What they could do is completely bottom out this coming season, get as high a pick as possible, that combined with some of the most cap space in the NBA could have the Spurs in contention again if they make all the right moves. But is Greg Popovich down for that? Does he really want to coach a team as bad as the Golden State Warriors were this year at 72 years old? Probably not, but either way, the Spurs are not gonna waste this off season. So the most realistic option is to kind of stand pat and wait till next off season. But let's say they really wanna go for it this off season. Let's start with free agency and let's start with signing Gordon Hayward. I know this is super unlikely, but here's how it could happen. If DeMar DeRozan opts out of his contract, Gordon Hayward opts out of his with the Celtics because the Spurs offer him a longer deal and a featured role. Think about it, he fills several needs, shooting, defense, and that star player. Obviously though, this would come with risk for the Spurs. They would tie a lot of money up into a guy who looks good since that injury, but hasn't been consistent yet. Next up in free agency, Christian Wood. The only thing that's held this guy back is maturity. If he was just more disciplined off the court, he's got star potential. He averaged just 13 points a game on 57% shooting this year for Detroit, but his minutes were managed. When he was made more of a starter after Andre Drummond was traded, he went off. In the final 15 games, Christian Wood averaged about 22 points, 10 boards, and a block. He's a good defender and three-point shooter at 39%, so he fills both big needs for the Spurs. Again, the only issue here is maturity. He's just 24 years old, so he could be a star for years to come. Sounds great, right? No, he will never ever be a spur. Just listen to this soundbite from Greg Popovich talking about the kind of guys they bring in. Before somebody comes in, we do our best to try to figure out who they are at that point and whether we really want to bring them or not. Because we've always thought, you know, people are who they are. Selfishness is pretty much not even a topic with the guys that we bring in. And if it shows itself, minutes are the best equalizer. Pass the ball! 
Look, I don't know Christian Wood personally, but if maturity is a problem like they say, forget it. Okay, so next, how about Jeremy Grant? He's a versatile player who's more realistic. Like Christian Wood, Jeremy Grant can defend multiple positions at a high level, and he hits about 40% from downtown. The big problem, as with everyone on this list, is money. Grant's got a player option worth 9.3 million bucks next season. If he turns it down, he probably wants more money. The Spurs could use that mid-level exception, but that's probably not enough cash. If DeMar DeRozan turns down his option, hey, the Spurs could easily fit Jeremy Grant in, but we'll see. Next up, Bogdan Bogdanovich. This is the shooter to replace Davis Bertans. The bogey is so much more than that. He can shoot, but he can also create for himself and others. He is a three-level scorer, not just a deep threat, and he's an upgrade defensively at the small forward spot. Bogdanovich is in his prime too at 27 years old, but there's always a catch with these. He is a restricted free agent. The Kings can match any offer, so the Spurs would probably have to pay a lot and get creative with their salary cap to outbid other teams and the Kings to get it. Okay, our last guy in free agency for the Spurs, another shooter, Joe Harris. I think the Nets actually would be idiots not to re-sign Joe Harris. He's a perfect fit with Kyrie and Kevin Durant, but you never know with those two, pretty unpredictable. The Spurs would get an automatic shooter with a really quick release, who's comfortable shooting on the move too. He can attack closeouts, and he's not a minus defender either. Kyrie did not mention Joe's name in that locker room rant about his teammates. Brooklyn would have to go into the luxury tax too, so maybe Joe Harris will be available. Okay, let's get into some trades for the offseason. But when you think Spurs, you don't really think trades, especially big trades. But if the Spurs wanted to, they could make some really huge trades because they've got the tools. If DeMar DeRozan opts in to that big one year, then they could have as many as eight expiring contracts worth 90 million bucks. They could get any player or two with that, plus all their future draft picks. But again, that is highly unlikely. The Spurs just don't make moves like that. So let's talk about some realistic trades, then some unrealistic dream trades. Realistic trade number one, Jarrett Allen and Nick Claxton to the Spurs for Trey Lyles and a 2021 first and 2022 second round pick. The Nets trade a really good player in Jarrett Allen for two reasons. He also is an expiring contract and instead of letting him go for nothing, they get a high second round pick, which is like a late first, and an actual first in two years from San Antonio. The Spurs are taking on a lot of risk here because Allen might not want to re-sign in San Antonio. The Nets let Jarrett Allen go because they have DeAndre Jordan. Allen is the better player, but Jordan needs to play to keep KD and Kyrie happy. The Spurs pull off a great trade here. They get the best young rim protector in the league, and while he doesn't shoot well from three, Allen is good in the paint and as a role man. He's just 22 years old, and he fits their young core. Realistic trade number two, John Collins for Trey Lyles and a 2021 first round pick. You know there are a lot of people out there who don't believe that John Collins could be traded? Okay, first off, they got Clint Capella, who plays the same position and will play well with Trey Young in pick and roll. I know John Collins shoots and Capella doesn't, right? Well, Collins does not want to be reduced to some spot up shooter. He's going to want upwards of 20 million bucks next season, and the Hawks don't think he's worth that much. The Spurs, though, would be able to afford it. The Spurs part with a first round pick because other teams will be bidding for John Collins, but this is a move that would help them big. He's one of the best young front court players on offense, and the Spurs need youth at that spot. All right, now for some real fun with our first dream trade. Bradley Beal for LaMarcus Aldridge, four first round picks and two pick swaps. The Spurs would need to send out at least this many picks because the market has been set on dudes like this. I mean, Paul George was traded for five first round picks, Anthony Davis for three, and he was on an expiring deal. Bradley Beal for four plus two pick swaps would be as good as Washington could do. On the Spurs, Beal would be a veteran to lead that young team, and he'd be a huge upgrade at the two guard to go alongside DeJounte Murray going forward. Dream trade number two, LaMarcus Aldridge, Trey Lyles in four firsts for Joel Embiid. Another mega trade where the Spurs uncharacteristically sell their future, but for a player like Embiid, it might be worth it. 
The Sixers do this to go all in on building around Ben Simmons. With all the Spurs first round picks, they can either go shopping for a shooter, the kind that Markel Fultz never turned into, or they could build through the draft. The Spurs get the best player in the East when healthy and focused, and they try to revitalize his career in the new culture. And dream trade number three, Victor Oladipo to the Spurs for Patty Mills, Trey Lyles, Chumizi Mitu, and two first round picks in 2021 and 23. This is a dream, unrealistic trade because the Spurs would never trade two first round picks for an injured star. On the other hand, that's why he's so cheap. Getting Oladipo for two firsts and salaries would be a bargain. If the trade paid off, they'd have a star to build around too for the future. He's a playmaker who creates his own shot and makes his teammates better, but Oladipo alone would not be enough in the West. They would need another big trade or hope one of their young players blossoms. But, so you don't think I'm totally crazy, what I think the Spurs will do this offseason is no big moves. They'll probably pay Jakob Pertl and let Bryn Forbes walk to sort of stand pat for next offseason when they have a lot of flexibility. One thing we know for sure, the Spurs always have a plan. Support AM Hoops and click subscribe. Don't miss a daily NBA video.